Okay. So the reason why we talked about biomarkers is that I know as clinicians we're all been very frustrated about not having a diagnostic test that you can't just diagnose with a blood test. And as a person who designs clinical trials, I'm frustrated because I have to use self-report instruments to get my endpoints, which is terrible. I mean, you, you can imagine if you use pain. Think, it's actually kind of interesting. All the depression literature it uses self-report. You know, there's no biomarker for depression. And if you look at how pretty much crummy the depression clinical trials literature is, I mean, they're very hard to reproduce a clinical study because because self-report uh, instruments aren't very good. Even, you know, how depressed are you? It's just not a very good enough thing. And so how fatigued are you? How much pain do you have? How debilitated are you? These, these are, are useful. But it, even in, uh, within the clinic population, people will peg, if you have a scale from 0 to 10, and 10 is the worst in the whole wide world. I've never felt so bad in my whole life. This is my worst day of my whole life you'll find patients that peg a 10 every time you see them. You say, this can't be the worst day of your life. It was the worst day of your life the last time I saw you. So you guys got to give me a little spread here so I know if I'm making any, any headway. And they'll be talking to them and they'll be saying, well, yeah, I'm feeling a whole lot better. I said, well, then why did you score 10s? I mean, come on now. How am I going to know when anyone's better? So when doing clinical trials, it's really, really difficult. If you don't have some sort of biomarker, you can hang your hat on. And so it's very exciting that we're coming up with some potential biomarkers um, particularly the neuropeptide Y one that, that correlated so much across different domains of the illness. I think that one's particularly useful for, for doing um, clinical trials. And for diagnostics, what we're going to end up with is um, sort of a compilation of things that'll be on, like this little spot thing she was talking about with these pixels, where you can put a, three or four different cytokines that in that pattern, they're unique to chronic fatigue ME. And then we'll circle the group that way. And then we'll use like neuropeptide Y to, to say, and, and how sick are you? And then we'll be able to use, use that kind of thing in clinical trials. So we're very excited because we think the biomarkers are this close to being able to be used in clinical, clinic, you, well, you'll be able to order them, which will be very exciting. So if we go back to this model, I'm, I'm going to be very practical now because uh, the, I'm going to talk about management. What do you do with chronic fatigue in ME? And, um, and we're talking about these mediators. Because your patient's already sick. They, they may or may not have a genetic predisposition, but then something happened, they got sick, now they're sick, and sometimes they've been sick for years. And what you really want to know is, why hasn't this person recovered? Why can't they get back to their old baseline? And it turns out to be complicated. It's a, it's a, um, it's a homeostatic screw-up. You have a bunch of systems that lean on each other. The autonomic nervous system, oh, it keeps doing that. Sorry about that. The um, autonomic nervous system and the immune system are, are hardwired as well as softwired. They, they got, you know, synapses of, of the nervous system ending up in the spleen, you know, the, next to a lymphocyte. Pictures of that. Hardwired, the, brain, the autonomic nervous system to the, to the immune system. And the flip side, they're chemically wired back and forth. Things that I call cytokines as an immunologist, a neurologist is calling a neuropeptide. And they're the same exact chemicals. Many of the things we call cytokines have different names when you're coming through the brain. And, and, and yet the chemical structure is identical. You know, we were talking the same thing. And it makes sense that cells know how to make and program and use to communicate the same kinds of signals. So you have on a lymphocyte receptors for serotonin, for norepinephrine, for all the neuropeptides. They're all there. And they're all on the lymphocyte. And the flip side in the brain Interleukin-1 is really powerful in the brain. It really has a lot of effects, or tumor necrosis factor. So, so it's all very hardwired, and there's a lot of different downstream effects. So I'm just going to go through these systems and say what we know and what you might do. The first is the endocrine system. There's 25 years of research on the endocrine system in chronic fatigue and ME, and basically it's blunted. If it's the best word to describe it, everything's blunted. There's lower cortisol levels. That's interesting because in depression, they're high. And it's one of the very first biomarkers that we could point at to say depression and chronic fatigue ME are not the same animal. And they're not. If you look at the size of the adrenal glands in a chronic depression patient, they have a chronic stress response going constantly. And they get a big HPA. And the adrenal gland actually gets big and boggy. And you can measure a size difference from normal. The adrenal glands enlarged, and of course, cortisol levels are elevated. 
Whereas in ME, it's quite the opposite. The adrenal is very small compared to normal, and the adrenal reserve is very low. It's almost Addisonian, very close. And the normals are in normal range, normal right in the middle of normal, and ME right at the bottom of normal. And the arrow bar goes all the way below into the Addisonian range. So there is an endocrine problem. And we got all focused on cortisol very early on because it was the obvious one to look at. But in our work, when we try to do all the systems biology, thyroid is integral, a key player to all the endocrine immune autonomic interactions. And even though thyroid functions normal, I'd watch it like a hawk as a clinician because patients that are drifting into hypothyroidism, the TSH is drifting up, they're drifting down. And it's something you can, you can take care of. So it's something I, 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 every year I repeat those thyroids and make sure my patient's not drifting into hypothyroidism. Because how would you know? It looks the same, you know? It really does. Hypothyroidism and me have a lot to share. Estrogen and testosterone, I call it the elephant in the room. Very little work in our field on the gonadal axis. But women reach menopause 10 years early, 42 average age. There's something seriously wrong with the HPG because the gonadal axis is really screwed up. And so they're perimenopausal in their late 30s, which is, that's a lot to go through. And it's very common for someone with ME or CFS to be cruising along, maybe get a little better, and then when they hit menopause, it's like hitting a wall and they relapse. It's a very, very rough time for an ME patient. And, and, and so we have this big controversy. Should we be treating with estrogens? Shouldn't we be treated with estrogens? Of course, the HERS study made us pull everyone off of estrogen. When I pulled everyone off of estrogen, I had my whole population of postmenopausal women relapse, everybody. And I put them all right back on. Within three months, I had them all back on their estrogens. And I went, OK, I'm not going to do it that way again. <laughs> it was really terrible. I mean, they were, they were doing great, and then they were crashing left and right. And then you had to go more case by case and say, okay, what's this patient's risk? And I, what's their breast cancer risk? What's their score? Is it safe to use estrogen or isn't it safe to use estrogen? But the flip side, their natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells don't work very well, and they're your anti-cancer defense. So you don't want to do something that's going to promote cancer, and then, oh, by the way, your cancer cells don't work well. So it's, it's a very difficult situation as a GP to decide what to do about this. Because in your heart and soul, you want to keep those estrogens normal. And then your other heart and soul says, oh my gosh, am I really doing the right thing in the long run? Testosterone. Women's testosterones can be very low. And women need a little testosterone. It helps, build this, it helps set their muscle mass index. And muscle mass is part of your metabolic rate. The whole, if you do all the formulas of what causes metabolic rates, muscle mass is a part of it. So low, low testosterones or zero testosterones aren't normal. Uh, and, and they can be addressed, um, but they have to be very, very gingerly done because, of course, women have very low testosterone and you don't want to overshoot. And the products are pretty crummy and they're mostly transdermal and they're mostly formulated and they're mostly meant for men and they're trying to get 100 fold less doses. So sometimes they're not very great, the, the testosterone products. In men, testosterone levels can be very low and they can also go through a sort of male menopause, if you would, and andropause, very young. And so you've got someone that you measured your testosterone on, say, when they were 25 and it looked okay, but now they're 35 and you haven't looked in 10 years, and oh my gosh, it's all but absent. And there's something you can do something about. Again, with that same worry, well, what about giving someone a hormone that could feed a tumor? But at least with prostate cancer, we can keep an eye on it better. It's, a, it's something we have a better measure of. Um, but uh, testosterone needs to be watched. I've had three cases this six, last six months of 18, 19, 20-year-old men coming in with chronic fatigue syndrome with practically no testosterone on board. Very interesting. Both with an acute viral infection, come in with a chronic fatiguing illness, put them on testosterone, they do great. Now, is that chronic fatigue syndrome? I don't know. It might have just been you know, a viral orchitis or something, and they lost their androgen production. But it's an interesting thing to watch. So the sleep cycle alone is not enough to explain the hypothalamic and pituitary dysfunction, though it is a part of it, because they have a real blunting of circadian rhythm, because their sleep is terrible and they don't get slow wave sleep. And so, so that's part of it. And getting their sleep right can begin to help their hormones, but it's not everything. Autonomics. 
Autonomics is huge in chronic fatigue ME. It's huge. It's like the daily trigger of relapse. You're going along through your life, and you're constantly hitting the wall, hitting the wall, hitting the wall, and it's an autonomic trigger. And that autonomic immune connection is like a super highway. When they hit their autonomic button, they flame on their immune button. And they get all these inflammatory responses. So it's the basic sympathetic parasympathetic balance where you and I, when we um, stand up, have a little orthostatic adjustment, and we wobble a little bit and we go, right? But these guys get a big wobble. And they get a delay. They don't get it in the first three minutes. It can be 20, 25 minutes after they stand up when they get this delayed hypotension or delayed massive tachycardia. It can, the tachycardia can present like a panic attack, and it's not a panic attack. It's hypotension with tachycardia as a result of an autonomic dysfunction. So the clue there is that you've got a patient who's never had any psychiatric issues, perfectly rational human being, who's suddenly having these palpitations and flushings and all this stuff is going on, and it's happening when they're upright. It doesn't happen when they're lying down. And then they get drugged with Xanax, and they get drugged with all these other kinds of psych drugs, and they don't have a psych problem. Their issue is they actually have postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and it feels horrible, and it's sudden, and it's like that. So what I do in my patients to sort this stuff out, see, I have another slide on that. Well, they have tilt table instability. The gold standard is a tilt table test, and it is the best test, but it's miserable to put the patients through. They're at a tilt. It's a simple tilt. You just put them up at 85 degrees on a table, and they have a blood pressure, continuous blood pressure monitor and a pulse, an EKG. And the, um, you just keep them up for 35 minutes. And about 20, 25, 30 minutes into the test, all hell breaks loose, and you have to put them down real quick. And then, you know, you get 20 minutes of upright before all hell breaks loose. And it'll either be hypotension or tachycardia or both. So it's either POTS or neurally mediated hypotension. Now, here's what's happening. And there's other um, autonomic things happening. They have gastric emptying delays. They have um, irritable bowel. They have a lot of, of autonomic other symptoms. But the cardiovascular system is the easiest one to measure. And something so simple as a 24-hour Holter, you can look at an RR variability and see how, how much autonomic instability they have. There's, there's some very easy measures to get that can tell you something about autonomic nervous system. But the easiest by far is to tell the patient to get a blood pressure cuff, the kind that you push the button and it reads out, and let them do some home monitoring. So you let them go flat. OK, now I want one at 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes upright. And if you have a crash during the day, grab it. Better yet, if they have a little glucose monitor and they can do a blood sugar right then too, because then you've got it. If they crash all of a sudden, they either got hypoglycemic or they got hypotensive. or, or It's one or the other. So you'd like to know which one you're treating. But, um, in a week, you can have a pretty decent uh, little self-report from the patient, and, and they're anxious to, to do this well. So if you give them the right kind of little spreadsheet, they'll fill it all out for you, and it's very helpful. Core to all of this is that the patients have a low blood volume. They're a liter short. We did 100 patients, tagged their red cells, tagged their plasma volume, nuclear medicine study, very, very accurate, down to the last little CC. And then you compare the patient to female, 42-year-old, BMI X, you know, I mean, it's a very accurate, normal control data set to compare it to. And these patients are roughly just shy of a liter short of blood volume. It was so impressive that the NIH funded us to do an erythropoietin intervention. We did a placebo control study, 100 patients in each arm with uh, EPO, with Procrit. And we actually got some very nice clinical responses. We never got to do a uh, phase two, three study. I'm sorry, phase three. That was a phase two. We never did the bigger study because right about the time we finished the study, the black box warning about leukemia came out on the, on the EPO products. And I was afraid in the setting of poor NK cell function and potentially oncogenic viruses that we were following to use a drug that might stimulate a lymphoproliferative disorder. So we never moved further. So instead, in treatment, very, this is a very important pearl. When a patient's crashing, 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 get some blood volume into these patients. And there's two types of patients. The ones that drop their pressure and they're running around with low blood pressures, that's the majority. They'll say, I always have a low blood pressure, doctor. And you say, really? And they say, yeah. It's, and then you look in your chart and you go, oh my gosh, we got a bunch of measures in here that are well below 90 over 60. You know? And I've been just letting that one slide. But you know, they're running 80 over, 80 over 40. You see it all the time. Those patients are low. Blood volume low, and a simple volume increase will make them feel a whole lot better. 
Remember, the core of all of this autonomic instability is the stretch receptors in the heart. So when the stretch receptors are shrunken up, when, they, when you stand up in your blood pools and your legs, stretch receptors go like this, sympathetic signal to the brain that says, you know, go, 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 adrenaline, 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 okay, makes them epi. You tack up, you vasoconstrict, you push all that blood back up to the heart. The stretch receptors see a little something more. They go, oh, that's much better, thank you. And you get a parasympathetic downregulation. So if yours is normal, you get a little subtle thing. But if yours is abnormal in a low blood volume state, you get um, a very dramatic change, okay? And that's when you see this delayed neurally mediated hypotension. The clinical statement is, you know, doc, I'm doing pretty good. I get in my car. I go to the store. The second, every time it's the second row of the grocery store, when I know if I don't sit down right now, something bad's going to happen. And I might get back to my car, or I might just sit right down there on the floor. It's embarrassing. But yeah, they don't actually pass out. It's, not, it's near syncope. It's not syncope. But it's consistent. They get to the second row, not the third, not the first. They've they got a 20-minute you know, button, and, and then they're gone. And if you just increase the blood volume, you do them a world of good. The other time when you can increase the blood volume and do a world of good is when they come in with a crash. When you, this is particularly good in the emergency room. A patient comes in and they're just crashed. And no, the family freaks out. They bring them in. A liter of saline. Dramatic. Drama. Very impressive. It's like, you ever had those little dehydrated kids that are vomiting and you can't stop their vomiting because now they're dehydrated and they're vomiting because they're dehydrated? You know, remember that? And then you put them a little, little couple of cc's of blood into those little babies and they go, whoo, and they're like a little rose. They pink up and they smile and gurgle and they look wonderful. Well, that's what happens with a chronic fatigue patient you put a liter of saline into. They just pink up, rose up, look good, feel good, incredibly grateful. And it was cheap, it was easy, and it worked. Now, the other group of autonomically dysfunctional people are the hypertensive, but still autonomically crazy patients that are just fluctuating like this. And that's because they over-vasoconstrict in their low blood volume state. So they come to you and you see a hypertensive patient. You give them a diuretic. Oh my God. Now they, you got uncontrolled hypertension because now they vasoconstrict some more. And they don't actually do better until you shift to a beta blocker, which suddenly makes sense. Because think about the stretch receptors. Here you are in your low blood volume state, vasoconstricting away, just trying to get enough blood flow up there. And uh, and there's only a couple of things you can do. You can increase the blood volume, salt, Florinaf. I love, personally, my favorite fix is Gatorade for breakfast, Gatorade for lunch. You know, lots of electrolyte solutions. Substitute electrolytes for water as much as you can. And then they just do very, very well without any, any real need for drugs. But, um, so you can increase the blood volume. You can decrease the space it pools in. So you can use alpha-1 agonists like mitodrine to uh, vasoconstrict the veins. It preferentially vasoconstricts veins over arteries. Now that works very well. Mitogen is a really cool thing. It's an alpha-1 agonist. Proamatine is the brand name. And, um, and it does this va venous vasoconstriction. It does increase the blood pressure about 10 points. And it does it when they're supine. That's when their blood pressure is the highest. It's the opposite of what you see in your office because they're sitting up when you take their blood pressure. So again, whenever you do a blood pressure manipulation in this patient, give them the, the blood pressure cuff thing and give them another week of readings. I want to see you're flat. I want to see you're upright. I want to see if you're crashing. Give the patient a, a job to do. And then you'll get a nice little sense of whether or not you kept them in a safe range. But mitogen works like, like compression hose. So there's another option, compression hose. Vasoconstrict the space that the blood falls into. Keep that blood coming back. But the third trick is to give the heart a little more time between beats, which is why the beta blocker works so well on a hypertensive chronic fatigue or ME patient. Because here you are saying, I'm going to just give it some more fill time. Slow the heart rate down. I'll fill some more. My stretch receptors are happy. Everybody's happy. So you got volume, vasoconstriction, and beta blockers. Those are your three buttons you can push in um, this pipes and pump system. The final thing on my little list there is um, reconditioning. And I'm going to come to this at the very end because it's tricky to recondition these patients, but think Pilates, think core, think ve the vena cava is the biggest, boggiest balloon in the body that, to pull into. So can I tighten the abdomen? So I give the patients a lot of uh, Pilates type of reconditioning exercises. 
At what point do you need a cardiologist or an autonomic neurologist to help you? Well, if you got one in town that's got a tilt table test and is the wizard at autonomics, that's great. But in my experience, they're hard to find. Very, very hard to find. But if you got somebody you like that you think could do this that can help you, but you can do this. This doesn't need a uh, uh, specialist to be able to treat uh, NMH or, or POTS. Immune system. Miriam was describing an overactivated, underfunctional immune system. In essence, an immune exhausted state, a system that's been pushed on, on, on to the point where the cells just don't have the stuff inside them anymore. They needed to do the viral killing. So they're, wor they're wearing out. So there's a couple of options. There's a drug in, called Amplogen that's uh, improved in Canada, and you know, someday, maybe, someday, it'll come here. It's not in the United States yet either. There are immunomodulators that we've been trying out in phase one studies that are pointing at the pro-inflammatory cytokine cascade, just like um, rheumatoid arthritis drugs, Embro, you know, TNF monoclonals, that type of thing. So we've been trying to clinical trials down that line, but we haven't gotten to phase two yet, so that's not ready for prime time yet, though they really work well in those high TNF patients, since some dramatic results. Um, interferon, that's been used by one doctor, Dr. Chia, John Chia, he's published some papers using this as an antiviral approach. Um, but these are tough drugs. MS patients, as you know, take alpha or gamma, and he's using alpha and gamma at one time in the patients. It's a pretty intense uh, medication regimen, hard to tolerate. Um, this is the easy one. Isoprenosine and immunovir. Isoprenosine is immunovir. Inosin is the over-the-counter um, um, supplement form of a very similar drug. And it's um, just an amino acid that makes up most of the core structure of those enzymes that Marianne was talking about, the granzymes that are inside the cells, the ones that do the killing. So this is more or less a nutraceutical. It's feeding this lymphocyte chow. It's feeding the cells the stuff that are rolling through too fast. And it really does improve function. In vitro, we get double up natural killer cell function with that approach. I use it five days a week because um, it's an amino acid, and whenever you use amino acid in a large dose, you can make uric acid as the breakdown of a protein, right? So, so uric acid um, can rise, and you can get uh, gout or renal stones. So I use uh, five days a week, two days off, in part to keep the risk of um, renal stones down. Um, I've seen gout twice, and I've seen one renal stone, so it does happen. I actually use a little higher dose than this, but I think this is probably a bit safer to, for, I, I alternate. I use this dose um, on even weeks and double this dose on odd, and I get very nice results. That was what the placebo control study in ME used as a, as a published uh, phase two study. There's been no phase three work yet, though. One of the problems when you have generic drugs is it's very difficult to do phase three work. We have no funding agency that would fund it. And of course, the pharmaceutical companies have no interest in it. So we get as far as phase two, we can usually get that, that kind of money together. And we don't get stuck on phase three. We're trying to address that in the United States with um, pressing very hard to develop research centers that are funded to do this type of uh, unappreciated but very necessary work. <laughs> unappreciated for a lot of reasons. So let's talk about viruses for a moment because it's the hot area in our field. It's, it's the new, exciting, hot thing. It's not that new. In 1980, we talked a lot about Epstein-Barr virus. And there's every kind of reason to believe EBV reactivates in these patients. When you're looking at your Epstein-Barr virus serology, you get a panel of four things. You end up with um, IgG, VCA, and EBNA IgG, which are your old long-term protective antibodies from the infection you had back in the day. You have um, early antigen, EA. That only pops up when the virus has been up very recently. So EA is a very good discriminator of reactivation. And IgM. Now, IgM doesn't ever have to come up again. It's not supposed to. If it does, you've definitely reactivated a virus recently. So EA and IgM become very, very useful. When you're looking at that panel, don't overinterpret VCA and EBNA. But do pay close attention to A positive at any level EA and IgM, that they mean reactivation. CMV, the same thing. We don't have those four different types of viral antigens to look at. We just have IgG and IgM serologies, but IgM would be very meaningful. 
So, so it's very common to see EBV and CMV reactivate, and particularly EBV reactivate. In 1990, a virus called HHV6 was discovered, about the mid-90s, and it was discovered in a chronic fatigue syndrome sample at the NIH in Bob Gallo's lab. Dr. Dharma Blashi discovered this virus. And, um, he found it in chronic fatigue samples, and then he went and looked in HIV and found it there too. And so this uh, discovery of what has been a virus for, you know, eons and eons, but the discovery of a newly named virus, HHV6, is your three-day measles virus, the rubiola virus. And it's a latent form of this virus that reactivates later on if your immune system goes down. And so um, uh, HHV6 serology can be helpful. There was also a virus described in the early 1990s by Elaine DeFridis, HTLV1. It's a retrovirus. And she published a paper. The CDC quickly refuted her paper, and then she unfortunately um, did not continue working um, in the field, and it sort of died down. And then in 1997, Mike Holmes here in New Zealand published a paper showing budding retroviruses coming off of lymphocytes in uh, ME patients here in New Zealand. And unfortunately, because there's virtually no virologists in our group and in any of the research centers at that point, it really didn't get followed up on. And it didn't, nothing happened. Until very recently, when this very new paper describing retrovirus and chronic fatigue came out and hit the press. Um, there's also was a paper early in um, 2004 or so by John Chia describing enterovirus in the, in, in the gastric uh, mucosa. And that was an important paper because it taught us that we keep looking in the blood for something, we might be looking in the wrong compartment. So he published a paper in Lancet with this huge number of gastric biopsies, several hundred gastric biopsies, and several hundred controls, and showed that between 60 and 80 percent of the biopsies in chronic fatigue patients, depending on the method, were expressing Coxsackie B, and 20 percent of the GERD controls. So the lesson? A lot of people express virus. It's not that uncommon to make a reactivated virus, but it's way more common in chronic fatigue ME to see these kind of viruses. And here we have these patients that have a lot of gut complaints, lots and lots of gut complaints, and we haven't been thinking about it as a potential infection. Think way back, those of you as old as me or older, to the time when we didn't know ulcers were caused by bacteria. You know, we thought it was stress. But it wasn't. It was H. pylori. And here we are now saying, well, maybe all this stomach stuff that we've been saying has been all autonomic or it's all stress-related or it's all whatever, um, maybe it's actually a local inflammatory process that's causing all this stomach stuff. So XMRV. Oh, let me jump over that. Oh, there's an important thing on this slide, this one. Um, Dr. Dan Peterson did spinal fluids on 144 patients, and he found 44 with an abnormal something or other, an extra cell, a little protein, a little something to make him want to go the next step. And he sent those samples on, and he found that 17% of the overall sample had culture-positive spinal fluids for HHV6 virus. It was a huge deal. And, and, it's, and he sent them to three different laboratories. So he sent three independent conforming laboratories, and he got this 17% number for the, number, the subgroup of chronic fatigue patients that have an active virus in the spinal fluid compartment. So, I mean, there's been a lot of this discussion about whether or not ME is a good name, myalgic encephalomyelitis, but that's the encephalo, you know. You can't have a virus floating around in the brain compartment and say, oh, I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, it's not doing anything. So, uh, and there's a lot of other evidence of neuroinflammation, it's very subtle, but, but neuroinflammation in, in a, at least a fairly significant subgroup of the ME population. But that was a very interesting thing. And he treated them, and he treated them with very aggressive um, antivirals. He rolled up, he did um, acyclovir, and then valgang cyclovir, and he didn't clear them, and then he went to IV, went to foscovir and zidovivir, and then he could clear them with one or the other of those two. And if he cleared them, they got tremendously better. So in that little subgroup, there's at least a subgroup, a fairly big subgroup though, where virus may well be in the brain and playing a, a role in the overall condition. And they're hard to sort out because you have to have a lab willing to do the cultures for this virus, for herpes family virus. But they're out there. So enter XMRV. XMRV, you've probably not heard a lot about it because it's another newly described virus. X for xenotrophic, M for murine, RV, retrovirus. 
So XMRV is a mouse virus that jumped into the human species at some point in the past. We don't know at what, what point. It was first described by this guy, Bob Silverman, at the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, another guy at the uh, Dr. Degassi, Degassi at uh, UCSF. And they found it in prostate cancer. The reason why they looked was because um, Bob had described an RNA-L deficiency or defect in, these pr in a subgroup of prostate cancer patients that were young and had a very aggressive prostate cancer. And he hypothesized that if the RNA cell, which is a key part of the interferon induction pathway, which is your antiviral defense system within a cell, um, if that was broken, that that might be a group more susceptible to an oncogenic virus. So then he used this rather exciting new method that was just developed in the last five years, where you can put on a chip, when Marian was talking about her gene expression, we're looking at 30,000 different genes all at one time on a single chip, and a little chip of a slide. It's got 30,000 different gene probes on there. And we can look at all 30,000 all at once and, and we'll learn a lot. Well, they looked at 5,000 different viruses using that approach, 5,000 different probes for 5,000 different viruses, every known human virus, every known mammalian virus, they even put the plant viruses on the chip. And that's how they came to find this XMRV virus in a human sample, prostate cancer. And they found it in roughly, I forget, 30% or so of these prostate cancers that they had surveyed. And it was important because Dr. Sadalnik in our world of chronic fatigue ME had said there's an RNA-L defect in these patients. And he's been publishing on that for 20 years. There's a very significant abnormality of the interferon induction pathway in, uh, in the ME patient population. So this paper came out just a little over a year ago, last October a year. And it was from this group at the Whittemore Peterson Institute in Nevada, a young fledgling group. Um, Judy Mikovits is the senior author on that paper. And she had described this virus in a significant portion, 67% of the of 101 chronic fatigue patients when compared to 320 controls. 4% of controls, and it's 67% of the patients. If it's true, it's a huge deal, because it's the first time we're not talking about a simple reactivation virus. We're talking about something that's not in everyone, like Epstein-Barr, HHV6, and all these other viruses we're talking about. All of us have those, and our immune systems keep them down, and we don't get sick. So in those cases, we're saying something happened to the immune system, and we'll let them creep out. But in this case, if it's true, we're talking about a virus that's in this population and not in healthies. So then you can make a causal connection as a plausible hypothesis. You could say, did this virus ding the immune system and allow all that other stuff to happen? And that would be interesting if it turns out to be true. It has been a roller coaster year of yes, no, 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 yes, kind of um, papers that have been coming out. So in this original paper, like I said, it was 101 patients, a very wide but all U.S. cohort, a little heavily, 25% of the samples was, were patients in an epidemic that happened in that area, in the Incline Village epidemic. So um, it's been criticized by, by that. Um, but it was an impressive paper because they did um, PCR, primer probe things where you probe for it. They did culture, cultured it. They did sequencing and sequenced it. And they did scanning EMs and watched it bud off of cells. And these slides look exactly like the slides that Dr. Holmes here in New Zealand presented in 1997. This is very, very similar to Mike Holmes' work. And uh, it's, that's impressive. So um, the follow-up papers have been hard to interpret. First, in all, there have been nine papers that said, we looked and we didn't find it. And there have been two papers that said, we looked and we did find it. The nine papers that said not all used PCR and PCR only. They didn't look at using any of the other methods that you could use to look. And for whatever reason, they each chose their own personal favorite primer probe pair. They didn't reproduce the ones that were in the original paper. So that's kind of distressing. So it's, it's difficult to know. And it was true also in the prostate literature. Of those, Dr. Silverman said he found it in 30%, and then Dr. Singh said she found it in 20%, and 
And a guy in Texas said he found it in about 20%. And then everyone in Europe said, we never found it, couldn't find it at all. And then there was a couple more US studies that didn't find it. So the same kind of controversy rolls around there. And then you could say, well, it could be a regional virus. It could be something that's so new in the population that it's not spread across the globe all that evenly. And you know, you could make that argument, but we don't know it until you really do all of this kind of work and try to really prove it. But the most impressive of the papers that came out that was confirming came out from the NIH, and it was by um, Dr. Ader and Lowe. Dr. Ader has won one of the Lasky Prize, one of the biggest prizes in, in science. And uh, so he's a really excellent virus hunter type of scientist. And he did this. He pulled 35 samples out of the freezer that had been there for 20 years from the uh, Harvard uh, study that they'd done. And he looked in those samples and he found a virus, not exactly XMRV, found something that was closely related. XMRV is a murine leukemia virus, MLV. It's in the family of. And he found a virus very similar to it, an MLV that's just a few amino acids off of XMRV. And he found a couple of little subtypes in there. And he found it in these 35 samples. And he said, well, you know, maybe the freezer was contaminated. This might be some, some I mean, when there's mouse viruses, all, everyone yells about contamination. Apparently, if a mouse runs through your laboratory, everything in your lab is contaminated. So, uh, but his controls were negative, so that didn't make a lot of sense. So, uh, but they did go back and they found the original uh, patients who had their blood in the freezer, and they found eight of them. And they sequenced the virus from the freezer then they sequenced the virus in each individual patient, and patient by patient they matched up. So the mutations that were patient specific were in the patient 20 years later, and they found the virus. So for me, that was a pretty compelling, and I thought it was a very impressive piece of science. And then there's another one by uh, Maureen Hansen in Cornell, where she took fresh blood, and this, the argument in her lab is that she's never worked with mice ever. She's never had a mouse that she knew of in her laboratory. She's a plant biologist who's got sucked into the chronic fatigue world by virtue of uh, passion for, for the curiosity about the, uh, the illness. So um, she did this study. We did all these different types of methods. And she used fresh blood, so it hadn't been in a freezer. It didn't have a chance to be contaminated. It was all blinded, which is really important. All the controls came at the same time as a sample, so you couldn't say, well, on Monday I was contaminated. On Tuesday I wasn't, and I ran the patients on Monday. But, so she, she interspersed them randomly so she didn't know what she had. And she found um, in these fresh samples, 80% of, sam of the very ill cohort positive, 50% of the so-called recovered cohort positive, and one of the 10 uh, controls positive. And that one was a um, caregiver of one of the sick patients. So, so that's what we know. We got three positive studies. We got nine negative studies. None of the negative studies cultured, none of the negative studies sequenced. Well, they didn't have anything to sequence, they didn't find anything. So, um, so there you have it. It's, just watch it, it's going to get interesting. Do we know much more than that? We don't know how it jumped into humans. Well, you know, retroviruses do jump species, but we don't know how. Um, how is it spread? Uh, a lot of worry about sexual transmission. Now, the epidemiology of chronic fatigue syndrome would not suggest sexual transmission. You know, in HIV, we had, knew it was an STD long before we knew it was HIV. You know, long before the virus was identified, we knew it was an STD, just by virtue of the spread. You could, you could go back to the sentinel case and look at all the contacts, the contacts, the contacts, and you could do it without even knowing what the pathogen was. But uh, in this case, those of us that care for patients very rarely have husband-wife pairs that both have chronic fatigue syndrome. So you could make the argument that women are more likely to be ill if they got the virus, and maybe men are more resilient or something like that. I don't know. But, but, but we don't know anything about how it's spread. Almost all retroviruses, I mean, every retrovirus we know of is vertically transmitted. And believe it or not, 9% of the human genome is retrovirus. We have so much retrovirus in us for so many millions of years. You know, it's part of what we figure Darwin works by, you know, is the, uh, here, I'll borrow a little something from someone, pass it on using a viral vector to someone else, and, and we, we, you know, evolve. So we have a bunch of viral mystery, mystery genes that aren't whole intact viruses. They can't replicate. They're just bits and pieces of ancient virus that hit our genome many, many years ago. And this one, though, seems to be a replicating virus. 
And are there treatments? Well, this is the hardest thing, because the patients know now that we're doing this. And I have a, every single day, someone asks me for an antiretroviral. And I'm like, well, no, we can't have that yet. We have to do the studies. Oh, no, doc, I've been sick for 30 years. I need to go now. You know, this has been a terrible thing. And I'm like, well, you don't know. These, I'm an HIV doctor. I know these drugs. You don't want these drugs. You don't want these drugs unless they're the right drug for you. And you sure don't want to play you know, Russian roulette, drug by drug, to see which one you might tolerate. Because if there's anyone who's drug intolerant, it's this uh, population. They're really miserably difficult to try to treat because there's so many drugs they have very severe uh, reactions to. But in vitro, we do know that there's at least three of the current drugs that do uh, suppress this virus. It's AZT, tenofovir, and raltigravir. So two reverse transcriptase inhibitors and an integrase inhibitor. So that's kind of cool that there might be something out there. So watch that. It's going to be in the news when it happens. The, the clinical trials will happen if this is confirmed. And it's not going to happen until we have an assay that everyone believes really works and means something. And the problem is these assays are a mess right now. But I'm sure that that will get cleaned up rather quickly. It's a, it's a full court press by everybody in the field. Other viruses do matter, and um, even with retroviruses, if there is a retrovirus in there, when a virus is in a cell and another virus gets in the same cell, they borrow each other's stuff and they're all the more powerful, and it makes for a much more intense infection. We know in HIV, when we treated just the herpes family viruses, before we had antiretrovirals, the patients that were on acyclovir did better than the patients not on acyclovir. And of course, we weren't treating HIV. We were treating the co-infection. So uh, it's important to uh, realize that other viruses probably do matter, and it might be still a big focus. There have been some herpes virus antiviral clinical trials. Um, acyclovir was used very early on, but without any biomarker that circled a group that you would use it on. So I don't think it was really that meaningful to just randomly pick a group of chronic fatigue patients and throw acyclovir on without any you know, serology to suggest that they'd reactivate it. But there has been a study um, with Valgang cyclovir, a very small phase two, but it was very interesting because Dr. Montoya at Stanford did a study. And when he pulled his phase one and phase two data together, and he looked at those serologies, and he set, looked for responders and non-responders, he used Valsight, Valgang cyclovir, really potent, really expensive, and it can suppress EBV and HHV6 and CMV. But the cut line for responders were people that were EA positive, IgM positive, or an, uh, 1 to 160 or higher HHV6. If they were above that line, they had an 85% response rate. And if they're below that line, they had 5%. So it meant the serology was meaningful. The serology was picking out the viral reactivation group, which is cool that we have something we can measure that picks out a group that could respond to a kind of approach. Now, this is going to move on into phase three clinical trials. Enter pharmaceutical land. Valcite loses its patent this year. So the company that um, would sponsor the trials, Enthusiasm, is not as high as it might be. So one more time, we have to find somebody else to fund the, a very important study to do, which would be a phase three clinical trial. In vitro, acyclovir is suppressive of HHV6, but only at the higher levels, at the 800 TID levels of dosing not at the usual herpes simplex levels of dosing. So more like shingles. OK, talking about other mediators. Sleep. Sleep is a big deal. Basically trapped in alpha, very poor REM, very poor uh, stage 3. So they don't get uh, slow wave sleep. Um, so the treatments, very straightforward. The easy things, first, avoid alpha trappers. And all the diazepam derivative drugs, with the exception of Ambien, are um, trappers. So if you're giving people hypnotic, short-term hypnotics for this, it's not the right drug. In fact, you'll make it worse, okay? Instead, you have to think of something that will last all night long. So you have to go back old-fashioned to the drugs that lasted all night long, that risked a hangover, okay? And think of drugs to help people get past stage one, if not a slow-wave sleep inducer. And that would be the tricyclics. My personal favorite is doxepin, but I mean, I think amitriptyline works too. But I like doxepin because it comes in a pediatric elixir, and you can dose it really, really low, 5, 10, 15 milligrams, baby, baby doses, and get very nice effects. And again, put it in the patient's control. Here's your dose range, you know? Find your dose. And then warn them. They're going to have a morning hangover, but, at the, but at, with better sleep, they'll have a better day. 
And, and it can be very effective, and you don't tend to have to keep increasing the dose over time. They're very effective drugs at a low dose for a very long time. Slow-wave sleep inducers. Slow-wave sleep inducers are tricky. Mirtazapine, which is Remeron, is a slow-wave sleep inducer. It's an antidepressant. It's very sedating. It's a slow-wave sleep inducer. And, um, and it does it at a very low dose. And as you go the do bring the dose up into antidepressant ranges, you lose the sleep effect. And you gain the weight gain effect. So if you use uh, mirtazapine, keep it at 7.5 milligrams thereabouts. Not higher than 15, but 7.5, even a half of that, a quarter of a dose. And you'll get some slow-wave sleep induction without getting um, weight gain. Weight gain in these patients is a disaster. They can exercise without relapse, so they, they gain weight like crazy. And anything you do that does that to them, like amitriptyline, for instance, um, yeah, it's pretty miserable for them. There's a drug called gamma hydroxybutyrate or gamma butyrate. Um, Xyrem is the brand name. That is a, the old date rape drug of the 80s and 90s. It's so potent, slow-wave sleep inducer, you can't take it in the bathroom and walk to your bed. You could be on the floor. They have to take it at the bedside. And it drops them, boom, within 10 minutes into slow-wave sleep. It's a very potent drug. It's going to have a fibromyalgia label this year. It's just passed its second phase three clinical trial. So it's going to get a fibro label from the US FDA. And I presume that will extend beyond the US. But it's an expensive drug. Like I say, it's a cannon when a BB gun might work. So you might like to uh, start lightly. But if you have to go there, I've used this drug. Maybe I have 10 or 12 patients on this drug. These other drugs all claim some slow wave sleep induction. And I don't really see the data. I did a dug through the literature before I gave this, put these slides together. And they claim it, but I can't find the reason for the claim. So I'm going to throw it out there. Sonata probably has a little slow wave sleep induction that's very um, short acting a drug. So it might do it a little bit at the beginning of the night. This is the most important thing on this slide. In my population, I sleep study everybody. Because if you have non restorative sleep and you're so fatigued, you are going to go on disability about it, you're debilitated from that certainly you require some sort of sleep assessment. I mean, that makes sense to me. And there's a lot of apnea out there. But even in the patients who are apnea negative, if you wait 10 years, you've been following them, over the course of the illness, 50% of my patients have developed apnea. 50%. That's huge. And then you're just not getting anywhere. That's the major cause of their illness. At that point, you can't make anything better because the apnea is so damaging that you're losing ground just on the apnea. So I use um, an overnight O2 set, a little cheap gadget I bought online so I can justify my sleep studies. It cost me about 100 bucks to get a O2 sat meter that, that records 24 hours. It's really cool. And you download it, and then I can see if my patients are desaturating during the night. And then I can you know, convince the powers that be that the patient deserves an expensive sleep study. And uh, very helpful. Uh, pain. You can't talk about bad sleep without talking about pain because sometimes pain is the whole thing. If you can't sleep because I hurt, that makes sense. And so many of the fibro drugs report now on their sleep effect. And many of the clinical trials of the new fibro drugs are, are monitoring the benefit to sleep. Um, so fibro, very simply, 18 tender points, 11 of 18 equals fibro. You push hard enough to make your thumb blanch, and you count the number of ouches. It's not regional pain. It's diffuse pain. So you have to be above and below the midlines, left and right. And then uh, you can diagnose fibromyalgia. Fibro comes and goes in severity. So sometimes someone might only get eight. The next time they might be 18. So longitudinal follow-up of your patients is very helpful in making the diagnosis. You definitely can have chronic fatigue ME and fibro at the same time. 60% of the chronic fatigue patients also have fibro. Very common. Central pain processing is the new dogma. If you guys have drug reps like we have drug reps, someone's been in your office pounding on you about central pain processing and all the new ways to treat central pain processing because these guys are selling some drugs out there. But the basic concept is this. You have a neuron. It's making norepinephrine. There's a pain center. It's receiving norepinephrine. There's a glial cell on either side of that neuron making interleukin-1 and ramping the noise, ramping up the pain. So you've got three ways to go at pain. You can quiet the amount of signal going up. You can quiet the way the norepinephrine is being received in the signaling system. 
or you can quiet the amount of interleukin-1 being expressed by the glial cell. There's just those three tricks. That's the whole process. So when you look at the drugs that we have, we have pregabulin is labeled for fibro. It's the kissing cousin of gabapentin, neurontin. And uh, all the other neuroleptics, all of them, is a big class, slow pain signaling going up. Lyrica, though, has had phase three clinical trials of fibro, so it's got the label. And it may be the best one, but there's never been any head-to-head -head trials of any neuroleptic in fibromyalgia, so we don't know which of that class of drug does this trick the best. But it's out there, it exists. You guys don't have it very easily here, but you do have, pre you do have gabapentin. And gabapentin has a straight dose response curve all the way up into toxicity land. The more you use, the more pain control you get until you get to toxicity, and then you better back away. But um, my usual dosing in Neurontin is around 1,200 or so once a night, in the night, once a day. It's usually where I end up. But you can go a lot of range above that and a lot of range below that. Cymbalta and Civella, they're both um, interfering with that norepinephrine mechanism. But Cymbalta is one part serotonin reuptake inhibitor to one part norepi. And uh, milnazapin is one part serotonin to seven parts norepi. So this works better in depression with pain. This works better with pain alone. Pretty much that's the dividing line on those two. Um, they're both good. They both cause weight loss instead of weight gain. Lyrica causes weight gain. When you guys finally get this drug, watch out. These patients gain weight like you never did see. It's supposed to be only 30%, but you add ME to something like that, and look at 60, 70% of your patients are going to be gaining a lot of weight on Lyrica. So I'm a little back away from the Lyrica. I tend to use more gabapentin, but I do use Cymbalta and Civella, and I use them depending on comorbid depression or not. Um, but this is actually becoming my most favorite, which is low-dose naltrexone. LDN works on the glial cell on either side of that neurontin to prevent the interleukin-1 expression. So it prevents the neuroinflammation component. And since many of the symptoms that patients have with ME have to do with neuroinflammation, the sleep part is partly neuroinflammation. If you treat somebody with interferon for hepatitis C, their sleep goes nuts until you're done. If you put inflammatory cytokines in the brain, people don't sleep well. It, it will interfere with their sleep. And animal model after animal model shows that IL-1 is a real big player in uh, sleep disruption. Cognitive slowing. Our patients have cognitive slowing. They really have cognitive slowing. You can measure it. It's one of the objective markers. I use it in all my clinical trials. Processing speeds are slower. And when you look at functional MRIs and you see what's happening, they have some inflammatory, tiny little pinpoint spots of inflammation. And when they try to neuroprocess something, they have to literally jump to the other side of the brain. They have to go all the way from right to left. If I'm doing mental math, it's all in one little tiny spot. You know, I'm processing the numbers and, and getting the, the, the whole answer with a very tiny little bit of brain space. And I can double up my blood flow to that area while I'm using it. These patients don't double their blood flow. They have basal levels of blood flow when they're thinking, and they have to ping pong all around their brain to process a thought. And you can measure it in nanoseconds. They actually get the right answer, but it took longer. So you can measure processing speeds. And I think that in part that's due to this neuroinflammation, very subtle, low grade, and that this concept of reducing neuroinflammation is a good one. And here is a homeopathic approach to um, doing that. So when I'm using low-dose naltrexone, here's what you got. LDN is naltrexone, Narcan, right? We use it in the ER to reverse opiate addiction. At 100 milligrams, it shoves all the opiates off their receptors. It's a competitive inhibitor. So and, and in this situation, you're not playing with the opiate receptor. You're playing with a completely different area at tiny little doses. It's called a low affinity receptor versus a high affinity receptor. You do something quite different. What you do is downregulate glial IL-1 production, which is very neat. And so the dosing, if you ever try to use this, 1.5 milligrams at night the first month, 3.0, double it up the next month, and peak out at 4.5. You may find you have to back away from 4.5 and go back to 3. I've there's been a phase 2 study in fibro completed that reduced uh, pain by at least 50%.
In my own clinical experience, I've seen people canceling their back surgeries after starting this, which is pretty impressive. So it works on any chronic pain, not just fibro pain. Anybody with one of those pain signaling superhighways, you can downregulate um, with LDN if they're not on opiates. Now, if they're on opiates or long-term codeine or something, they say you can still do it, but I've had some um, withdrawal when I gave the first dose at 1.5. And you shouldn't do it because you think you need 100 milligrams, but I've seen it. So if you're going to use it in patients who are um, requiring stronger pain meds at the same time, you have to do it with more caution at even lower doses than this. They actually formulate an opiate with low-dose naltrexone, the two together in the same pill, because the other thing it does is pretend, prevent the potentiation of the drug. So if you're starting with 10 milligrams of something and it works for a while, now you have to go to 20 and then to 30 and to 40 at the same level of pain effect. If the LDN is dosed at the same time at the very beginning, page that's on the back of your handout. They're going to hand it out, so you don't want to write all this stuff down. But what I was trying to do on this particular slide is just show how many ways you can use a single drug for more than one effect, you know? Like amitriptyline for sleep and mental health and pain and migraine. You get a little effect all the way across the board, where some do and don't. And then some of the side effects that we most frequently see. So these are more of the psychotropic medications, if you would. And these are more of the uh, anti, the neuroleptics, okay? So you can see the neuroleptics actually have a tremendous benefit, and some of them are very readily available, and they can help with uh, pain and sleep, and sometimes some um, mental health issues as well. I'm very nervous of the uh, atypical antipsychotics, just uncomfortable using them. I've seen some tremendous weight gain on people with these, with these types of drugs. And the U.S., they throw this on everybody for anything. It's the most amazing thing. Seroquel all around. It's like a cocktail after dinner or something. I don't know, but it's getting crazy. I, those drug reps have been very busy. <laughs> um, the um, alternative strategies can be incredibly effective. I love acupuncture. Acupuncture is tremendously effective at, at pain management. And you can often get people off. I get people off of opiates. We have two full-time acupuncturists in my VA, my veterans hospital that I work in, which is pretty cool. I can't tell you how hard it was to get two acupuncturists on staff at a veterans hospital. But they're so busy, you can't get into them. It's just they're doing tremendous, tremendous good. Neuromuscular massage, very good. Um, stretching. If your patients aren't doing their stretches every day, they're a part of their own problem, and I just put it right back on them. They need to be doing really good stretches, and if they need to learn how to do that with the help of a physiotherapist, that would be very good. Just a couple of lessons. Show me how to do the stretches I need to do, because most of them are pretty good at doing forward stretches, but they totally forget the backwards ones, and then they're all hunched over like this all the time, and all their muscle groups are short because they haven't been in, in spasm. It's a misery. Exercise, the kind of, you know, I'll come back to this. Let me go to exercise. The kind of exercise they can do is very straightforward. They're aerobic nightmares, okay? We're doing this fantastic study where we put them on a bike and we measure all 30,000 genes if they're turned on or turned off before, during, and after exercise. And we're mapping out the whole homeostasis screw up. It's amazing. But I can tell you, so when you put someone on a bike and you measure blood five minutes later, they've gone from their normal with about 24 genes different than that, out of 30,000, 24 genes different than normal, to about 400 genes different from normal five minutes later, and they're inflammatory. So in an autonomic nervous system challenge is kicking off an inflammatory cascade. And then four hours later, autonomic, neuroendocrine, pain, um, oxidative stress, so on and so forth. So the inflammatory kick then kicks off all the genes that cause all the symptoms we just talked about. So it's the way up here in the front, at autonomic immune, at that little connection, that's the beginning of the daily relapse, right there. So you have to find a way to exercise them without triggering that. And, and that's really tricky. So what I do, I do this even more sophisticated than this, but this is pretty good advice. Five minutes of exercise that would be aerobic, a 10-minute flat break to re-perfuse. Because aerobic thresholds, the point where their lactic acid starts to kick, okay, is driving the whole downstream event. So 
keeping them before their lactic acid spot is really important. Now, because I got a bike and the gas exchange and all, I can actually measure it. And it really varies from about three minutes to eight minutes, but it means around five minutes in these patients. So what you do is you exercise them for just five minutes, flat for 10. They can stretch. They can do other things while they're flat. Then put them back up for five, then down for 10, then up for five, then down for 10, and add segments a little by little to the point where they're doing more and more five-minute bits. And that's the only aerobic stuff you're going to get away with. You're not going to get away with 5, 10, 15, 20. It doesn't work. You can do muscle bulking, and you can do a lot of flexibility stretching. I often tell the patients to get a Pilates for mats tape and set a timer and put the timer on for five minutes and do the first five minutes, then come back later and do the next five and the next five and the next five. Over the course of the day, do the 30-minute tape. And then they're at least getting some core stuff done and a lot of flexibility and stretching stuff done. And then we can introduce this um, more aerobic stuff over time. But it's always going to be the part that gets you. And any exercise they do flat is much better tolerated than upright. Well, why not? They're not perfusing. You know, their brain, they've got 80% of their blood flow below their belly button when they're upright. So how are they going to be able to maintain that level of aerobic challenge, their tachycardia? So swimming is fantastic. Recumbent bike. Anything that's flat because they're going to perfuse everything better. They're going to have a better, better effort and a better outcome. Oops. Finally, this nutrition business. Um, the things in yellow are the things that have had placebo control studies. NADH is supposed to boost energy. If it doesn't work in 30 days, it doesn't ever work. So I don't generally use it. Magnesium is great for muscle uh, spasms and muscle relaxation. So mu and, and you can measure magnesium levels and make sure they're OK. L-carnitine and CoQ10 are both anti antioxidants. They both have had some efficacy in clinical trials. And omega-3 fatty acids have had efficacy in clinical trials. Now, this is my magic concoction. I don't know how magical it is. I use, make sure their vitamin D is normal. Their vitamin Ds are always abnormal. I've never seen one yet that was normal, just like MS patients, always really low. It needs to be optimized. It needs to be optimized all the way up to 60 or better. Don't settle down at 40. Get it up there and work at it. If you have to use, I use at least 2,000 milligrams of vitamin D a day. But I often have to go to 50,000 units and get the levels up and then bring them back down to 2,000 a day to maintain. Omega-3 fatty acids, if you get up to 2,000 twice a day, you're at an anti-inflammatory level, which is very helpful. And they tolerate it very well. And since they're not going to tolerate a statin very well if they have any lipid problems, you're much better with the fish oils than you are with any, almost anything else. These guys already have tremendous muscle pain. You add a statin to that, and it's a mess. B-complex sublingual, that's partly to get people to stop asking me for in injections because the injections are really expensive. They're cyanocobalamin, which I'm not really happy with about the cyano part of it. I don't know that I should be unhappy, but it makes me feel bad writing it. And so I like these because these are methylcobalamin, much safer. It's sublingual, so you bypass the gut where there's often some dysbiosis or maybe... Coxsackie B, I don't know, but they really have trouble with B complex levels or B vitamins in general. And these are in a nice balance, a really cheap three or four dollars for a bottle for three months. It's really inexpensive, and they can do it every day to get great levels. But this is my favorite by far, ubiquinol. Ubiquinol because the Japanese did this kick ass great study where they treated um, placebo control, a great big group. Brought them into an exercise lab after one week of this dose of ubiquinol, 60 BID, and um, put them on a bike for two hours. It was an exercise challenge from hell. And they measured before, after, and four hours later the number of times you could do a 10-pound weight and perceived fatigue, blood tests for CPK, LDH, and free radicals. And then... Um, what happened was the placebo group was a little more fatigued, a little fewer reps, much more fatigued after the exercise, with a lot fewer reps. But they had a bump in CPK, a bump in LDH, and measurable free radicals. And then the uh, treated group had nothing, no bumps of anything. They had just their baseline CPK, LDH, and, and no measurable free radicals. So this stuff got into the cell, it sopped up all the free radicals, and it prevented cellular breakdown. And it's the first time I've ever seen any study with any antioxidant that actually did that. So now I just rely on it. I don't 
use hosts of other types of antioxidants. I said, this one I know it gets in. And you know, my HIV guys always are running around with high CPKs and high LDHs and huge amount of that kind of stuff and muscle pain. And I realized it's the oxidative stress. These guys have been, because of the drugs I prescribe, under tremendous oxidative stress, and they're breaking down muscle all the time, and I'm just letting it go. So now I have my ubiquinol on all my chronic viral patients or people that I'm basically messing up with something else. There was a study done with statins that if you premedicated for a week, you could prevent muscle pain in more than half of the cases that would have otherwise had statin-induced muscle pain. So ubiquinol has become my little favorite. There's a lot of dangers in, in different types of things our patients take. The most dangerous of by far is licorice root because it's what they make fluoroneph from, flugicortisone. And so um, they're taking it because they're clever. They read. They know they need flugicortisone, so they're taking licorice root. But the, um, it um, sucks in sodium at the expense of potassium, right? So they can become very hypokalemic. And then you have the first symptom, fatigue. Well, our patient's first symptom is fatigue. I mean, they missed that one. The second symptom is potentially fatal arrhythmia. So they can be running around with potassiums in the twos, and, and it's because they're self-medicating. So you have to be very careful. And then I warn them off of all the s supplements that are basically hormone extracts for a good reason, because God knows what's in them and where did they get them, and if it came from the brain compartment of a cow, is there a slow virus in there, and so on and so forth. And then some of our patients overhydrate. Um, they run around with a gallon jug of water because that we've told them to hydrate, and they, they listen. And then they flush out their loops of Henle, and they diurese, and now they're, they're dehydrated because they took too much water in, too much free water. They look like SIADH, but they did it themselves. So, uh, so I substitute Gatorade for water, and then they can't do that. We already talked about that. Finally, this is the best way to handle these patients from your perspective. When they come in, they're complicated, right? I just told you there's seven different systems you're messing with, and they're not going to fit into your 10-minute slot. I think that's fair to say, right? In fact, in my clinic, a new patient's two hours, and a follow-up's 45 minutes, and that's how I do it. But I have the luxury. I'm an academic. I'm not making my life off of my clinic. I get to do this, and no one's telling me what to do yet, although it's coming. But, but I get to play that way. What I say is break up the visit. First visit, Nice to know you, get to meet you, I'm going to read your fat file, I don't have time right now, I'll read it before I see you the next time. And um, that's basically, a, that's it, <laughs> not a whole lot. Second visit, though, we're going to talk about sleep. And that's all we're going to do the second visit is sleep. Let's just do sleep the second visit. Next visit after that, go ahead and make three or four appointments with me, because the next visit, I'm going to talk about pain. And the next visit, we're going to look at this and so on, and break it up. So you're only doing one chief complaint per visit, because otherwise they'll give you 25. But you just want one, and then the next, and then the next. And you can actually do it this way. And it's very nice, because they feel, you can make them feel your pain. You know, it's awful to walk out and there's this many patients in your waiting room, you know, because you spent all morning with this one. And uh, they can understand that. And if they know that you're hooked in, that you're really going to see them through, they'll be fine with that. And they love that you want them back, you want them back, you want them back, until you get this sorted out. They know that you're committed. So it's, it's a very good way to handle the complicated nature of this illness. One tiny little story to tell you. After Hurricane Andrew, I did a study with Mary Ann in Miami. Um, we called in all these chronic fatigue patients that had their houses blown away by the hurricane. And we called in all these patients one county north who missed the hurricane. And we thought we'd do a little stress study to see what happened after the stress of almost dying. Well. We had to include in the, in the study a PTSD instrument, a post-traumatic stress disorder instrument. And those instruments, if you've ever seen them, they're not just yes, no questions. You actually have to write a little paragraph about what is your trauma, what is your recurring nightmare. It's actually written out. There's a little verbal thing in there. So we did this, and we assumed there'd be a lot of PTSD in the, in the hurricane zone and not so much up north. Well, as it turned out, they were about the same. But when you looked at the, the little paragraph read, a very large number of the patient's trauma happened in a doctor's office. And it was being disregarded and being patronized and being dismissed and told you're crazy and go get your hair changed and you need a new boyfriend and divorce your husband. And all these things were told to them. It was just horrible. And they had it so many times by so many different doctors that it was their recurring nightmare to the point of PTSD. So if there was ever a time to say, first do no harm, 
first do no harm. If you don't want to take care of these patients, tell them up front. Don't pretend like you're taking care of them and not, you know. But if you are committed to trying to help someone feel better, then, uh, you know, they're going to appreciate because no one else did. You're going to be their new best friend. And they're really going to appreciate you because they really need this. Need this. So I think that, um, that really we can do a lot of good for these patients. And we're using our basic medical skills. I didn't give you any rocket science here. I just said use the skills you have. But bust it up into pieces and, and keep at it persistent like a, like a dog with a bone. Just hang on to it until you keep, get these patients moving in the right direction. This XMRV thing may turn out to be true. Just sort of keep your ear to the to the news, you know. I'm sure you'll be quick, quick to know when it turns out to, to, that someone proves it yes or no. But the real proof will be in the clinical trials. So the clinical trials will probably happen, and they will probably happen uh, later on in this year. So watch for that happening. And that's about it. There's some really great places to go. This website here, iacfs.net or iecfs slash me.net, you get at it either way, has on it some the self-report forms I was talking about where you can have patients fill things out before they see you and they can keep doing it every time they come and keep scoring their severity of illness or their pain or their sleep or whatever. It's all available right there with the scoring systems. There's also a very sweet thing that Cindy Bateman put in there, what her first visit is, what her second visit is, what her third visit is. Very nice, and in just a sort of little guideline thing there. So that's very helpful. Um, CFIS Association of America, very nice resource because they have uh, up-to-date stuff on this XMRV. Very nice uh, thing there. I don't know if you have many Gulf War patients, but that's a nice Gulf War uh, website. They all are good websites. So um, I'd like to thank you all. We are very grateful to all the people that have funded our work, including the NIH, the VA, the DOD, and the CFIDS Association of America. So, questions? <sighs> and this is the eighth time I've given a lecture in nine days. So if I talked fast, that's pretty good for a southerner. <laughs> we usually talk rather slow. Yes. Yes, the ones this this talk today with these slides will be on that website. You don't have to do the video; the slides will be up. Yeah. And how do you then test off your own legitimacy in that one measure and in nine? Well, you know, it's the free and the total, so you want them both to be abnormal to believe it. And the, the free um, is the more valuable of the two measures. The total is looking at protein binding. So that if you only get one measure, do the free. And I'd do it at least twice before I would um, intervene because they, they could potentially be wrong. Um, but it's very easy, you know, in men to get testosterone levels uh, back to normal. And they have the patches and the creams and the injectables. Now, the injectables do not enlarge the prostate as much as the transdermals. So in older men, you really kind of want to err to the side of injectables because, um, because the other, t other two will enlarge the prostate a little bit. So if you had um, two values of free testosterone which are normal, you wouldn't advise that somebody had No, I wouldn't. Because once you start someone on testosterone, it's just like starting someone on cortisol. You've just taken the end organ and fixed that problem, and then the H and the P won't ask so much. So you're going to reinforce the deficiency. So you really want to prove the deficiencies there. On the other hand, we have no hypothalamic or pituitary trick to pull. So it's really our only way to get testosterone levels back to normal. With cortisol, if I had ACTH, I'd rather use it. I mean, I think ACTH was the right drug to use for this kind of small, tiny, hypoadrenal function, but we, we don't have ACTH that easily anymore, so we could never do that study. Yes, I would, but be, know, know that every time you, you prescribe testosterone for the first month, the PSA bumps, okay? So you want to, don't look, it make you feel bad. Just, just you know, wait about three months and then check your PSA at that point, let it come back down. Because um, you're just you're going to have a lot of prostatic activity the first month after you put someone on testosterone. And the other thing about testosterone is don't expect it to be all that quick. It takes about four months to normalize. It really does. I was a young man that um, I saw at Christmas time, whose whose um, 
testosterone level was, was on the floor. And I started him then. And um, I saw him in January, nothing, February, nothing. I was very discouraged. I saw him again in March, nothing. And finally, in, in uh, April, I was about to send him off to an endocrinologist and see what I was doing wrong. In April, he came in just like a rose. He just perked all up. And now he's working full time, and he's back to school, and he's doing great, all in a matter of about six months' time. It was very nice. Yeah. Can it then be after a while they are back to normal? Like it can be discontinued. Conceivably, you could try it, you know, because you don't really know why the testosterone deficiency happened. I mean, there are, you know, there's some famous things. You know, mumps virus can cause uh, an orchitis and, and sudden loss of testosterone. But, um, but we don't know. This XMRV virus is very curious because it is a gonadotropal, it, it's, it's trophic to uh, gonadal tissue. It's trophic to T cells, B cells, and K cells, believe it or not, natural killer cells, cytotoxic T cells, and gonadal tissue and, and gut. That's where it goes. So uh, it might turn out to be something so straightforward as a virus infection. That would be really cool. I'm being very hopeful, you know, because it, we, we, those of us in this world, <laughs> Roz appreciates this every bit as much as I do. For 25 years, we've been watching these patients suffer. It has been very, very hard. You know, these patients really, really suffer, and they, they've been roundly disregarded by so many people. And, uh, and you can do these things, and it's very helpful, but it would be really, really wonderful if it turned out that a large portion of them could actually be treated with an antiviral. That'd be pretty exciting. Yes. A whole bunch of viruses have not been associated. In fact, Jay Levy did a huge survey of, of all the viruses we had serology for, and basically all the herpes family viruses are associated, all of them, herpes simplex, zoster, CMV, H, uh, EBV, and HHV6, the five that we know. Um, and that makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense because Everyone has these viruses usually, but the, the, the low Im immunity is what causes the problem with herpes viruses. <laughs> the, what keeps Epstein-Barr virus under control are natural killer cells, uh, cytotoxic T cells, and uh, other elements of the immune system. And there's another catch-22. These are viruses that infect T cells and B cells. And when the immune system is activated, a cell that's activated expresses whatever is in its program to express. So it's an infected cell, it expresses virus. In, H in HIV, let's just take a completely different example. In HIV patients, um, part of the reason why the immune system is destroyed by HIV is not because the virus got into the cell and blew it up. That's not really the, it's, it's a cause. But it's so immune activating that it turns on um, the immune system so widely that uh, it causes something called apoptosis, which is if you push the on button on the immune system and just lean on it for more than a few weeks, you start killing off cells because they have programmed cell death. They're not supposed to stay on all the time. And so, in this disease, we've been looking at apoptosis. Actually, there is a lot of cell turnover. There is an increased apoptotic um, uh, thing going on, not to the point where we're seeing cell numbers declining very dramatically, but there's a lot more cell turnover. But inside the cell, if you activate it and there was a virus latently sitting there, it's going to express. And so I think that's what we're seeing is the lymphotrophic and the, let's say the, the, the cells of the immune system that harbor latent viruses, and less so. Um, say shingles, you're not going to see that so much because that's in a nerve ending and you're not stimulating it as much. You might have decreased immune surveillance and it would come out, but you wouldn't directly activate it. So it's kind of interesting. Those are the kind of viruses we're seeing. And I'm sure there's others that we haven't looked for, you know. That's the thing about this field. There's only about 250 scientists doing all of this work over the last 25 years. It's not very many. At the HIV meetings, there's 14,000 retrovirologists. So one of the things that's, that's exciting, like this XMRV meeting, even if it's not true, the fact that at the XMRV meeting, there were 300 XM, there are retrovirologists sitting in the room and having uh, Dr. Collins, the head of the NIH, Francis Collins, telling us, we're going to figure out this, whether it's with, associated with prostate cancer and chronic fatigue or any other human disease. 
I was like, wow, the head of the NIH just said the word chronic fatigue syndrome out loud, which was very cool. And there's 300 bored retrovirologists in this room. They're looking for something new to do. And here's a virus that might be a human pathogen. So they're all in, you know? So it's very exciting for us because we're going to get a much big flush of new scientists into a, a field that's really needed some new scientists for a while. So it's exciting. Yeah? Are there any countries in the world that don't have CSS? That's so interesting a question. Because if it is, XMRV is regional, you know, you might wonder if there's regional variation. And if you look from country to country, for instance, in Japan, there's a tr something like a 5% rate of chronic fatigue in Japan. It's the highest in the world. But they have burnout so badly there that when I went to a, a fatigue meeting there, they showed up the sleep, uh, the hours people sleep uh, on average in their country. And it was two hours less than anywhere else in the world. They were sleeping five hours a night on average. And there were people, the range, the scores went from two to, I mean, there were some people who were sleeping only two or three hours a night, uh, routinely. So you wonder, is their chronic fatigue syndrome going to be the same thing as what I look at? I, I don't know. That's kind of fascinating. But there was a study in Nigeria that said that the rate was roughly the same as it is in the United States. So that's the one and only Africa study. There's been no studies in South America that I know of. So all we have is Europe, New Zealand, Australia, in the States to, to go from. Canada. Yeah, in Canada. Oops, Canada. Canada's actually on this. They, they, they have approved drugs and they're, they're very enthusiastic uh, about the science. Would you like to comment about immunizations and Oh, immunizations. That's always a touchy question. Actually, there's a couple of touchy questions. The first one's blood transfusion. I always tell my patients not to donate blood, partly because, hey, they're low a liter. How stupid would that be? Why would you want to get acutely lower? But the other is we don't know the cause, and we do know there's some virus floating about, and they really shouldn't donate blood. It doesn't make any sense. In the United States, they're still allowed to. We're having a meeting. As soon as I get back, actually, I'm on the committee that's going to supposedly decide one way or the other about that. Um, immunizations. When you immunize somebody, um, you activate their immune system. You know, I mean, you, there's an adjuvant in the, in the vaccine to try to stimulate the immune system. So usually people will feel worse after any immunization. Now, it's, I personally still recommend flu shots because if they get the flu, they're really out for a month or more. So if they can tolerate a flu shot, if they've done it before and it worked out okay, Yes, do it. But if they've had horrible outcomes when they've tried to be immunized in the past, of course, I would deny them their, I would say don't do it. Live vaccines, I'm not too keen on. Their immune systems are, are, are pretty poor. And I don't think I would trust them with a live vaccine. What do you do? Well, I don't tend to recommend flu injections because I've seen so many people relax. Yeah, they can. They really can with a flu shot. Well, that's really bad. I mean, I have some other people that tolerate it. It's, it's, it's a really person-by-person person thing. I would say I will give patients prescriptions for, um, for f this year's flu to have on the hand, on the shelf, so they jump in and start taking their flu medicine, like Tamiflu, yeah, um, and have them go fill it the minute they, they have a febrile flu-like illness, even without the confirmatory serologies. The um, amantadine, an interesting drug. Amantadine is a flu medicine, right? It covers type A but not B, or type B but not A. It covers half. I don't remember which half. And, uh, it's, and it, it's used in MS patients for fatigue. And that's just, oh, oh, by the way, we tried this in MS patients for the flu, and we noticed that they were less fatigued. And so a lot of doctors will try a little amantadine on this population and see whether or not it helps them. Um, I would say once in a while, it does. You know, it's almost worth a try because every once in a while. I have a patient in, um, in Hawaii, where I wish I was living, but she's living there, and she's, she was horribly impaired. She was housebound, and um, she takes one amantadine a day and one immunovir, which is the most she could tolerate. She, couldn't, she, couldn't, she worked really hard to get up to one immunovir, and she's been, for three consecutive years, able to drive her car, work as a guardian ad litem, and begin to have her life back after being housebound for almost 30 years. So you never know when you, you click into the right thing for the right patient. You know, I mean, I just don't give up. I just keep, well, that didn't work. Okay, okay, well, back to the drawing board. I'll try something else. But I, but I just, just, just won't give it up. It's, there's got to be something for everybody. Have you had any of them completely 
you recover. Absolutely. Absolutely, it does happen. Not as commonly as we'd like, but, and of course, the patients you never see again, <laughs> they get better. You see coma say, hey, what, what, what's happening? Oh, I'm just doing great. Once in a while, pregnancy will do it. Have you ever had that happen? A patient who gets pregnant? Well, that's a huge blood volume increase, right? 50%. You get a 50% blood volume increase. Your cortisols are cranking. Um, pregnancy is like a great thing, you'd think. And, uh, and then they have a baby, and then the baby doesn't sleep, and then that after, you know, red cells are 90 days, right? You get 90 days, you get 90 days of increased blood volume, and then it's over. <laughs> the honeymoon is over. <laughs> the cortisols have gone down. So you can expect a relapse if you're going to see one in about the third month postpartum. But uh, so I'm always like, if you're going to have a baby, where's the partner? Who's getting up? You know, it, are you going to get a good night's sleep with that baby? But if you can, then yeah, that might actually do something. And then I had a patient that was pregnant for like five pregnancies in a row as quick as she could because every time she had a baby, she got a little bit better, but not all the way. And then she had another baby, she got a little bit better. The fifth baby, you know, she's better, but now she's five kids under the age of seven, you know? It's like, oh, geez. <laughs> Trade one disease for something altogether different. <laughs> but she's happy. <laughs> Anything else? All right, well, let's call that the evening then.